grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh, it gets called a lot of different things. Low self-esteem, uh, poor self-worth, bad self-image, dis-ease, that's dis-ease. But all these words are basically talking about the same thing, guilt. One psychologist said, a guilty conscience is the seasoning of daily life. I don't think we realize that because we're reluctant to admit how much guilt is in our daily lives. But what is it? In the Alpha Course, Nikki Gumbel quotes a letter written to the IRS, apparently from someone who had cheated on their taxes. The letter says, Dear Sir, I am sending you this $100 because I am unable to sleep at night. P.S. If I'm still unable to sleep, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> okay, so this man felt guilty. But still the question, what is guilt? In the 20th century, we've been taught that guilt is a feeling. In other words, it's psychological, entirely psychological. Nothing more than that. Nothing more than a completely subjective feeling. We've been taught that. But is it true? I've got a different thesis for you. Certainly there are guilty feelings, but beneath those feelings is real guilt. The feeling of guilt is that my guilt and my wrongdoing is not just a feeling. Now, plenty of people argue against that thesis and say, no, no, guilt is just a feeling. Your guilt comes from the standards your family set on you that you could not reach. And others say, no, no, it comes from the standards society put on you which you can't reach. Others would say, Guilt comes from your inability to adjust your expectations and your choices to reality. So a guilt problem is always a problem of maladjustment. You're maladapted. You have to adjust your expectations, and you've got to adjust your choices and your standards to your reality. Not doing that is where guilt comes from. It's all a feeling. It's all subjective. If you were able to deal with the family and society and make these adjustments, it would just go away. That is the modern theory. But are we finding it to be true? Here's what I find. That all people, whether they believe in God or they don't, even if they don't believe in anything at all, they don't believe in sin, hell, afterlife, sin, not anything. Nonetheless, all wake up every morning feeling ashamed at some level. They've got a voice in them. You do have this voice. A voice in you that calls you a coward, calls you a fool, calls you a sinner, makes you feel vile, and makes you feel guilty. What are you going to do with that voice? You're just going to call it a complex? I've got a different thesis for you. When Lady Macbeth, you know Shakespeare's Macbeth? When Lady Macbeth walked around trying to get the spots of blood she could see off her hands, she bore witness to the fact that guilt is a feeling that my wrongdoings are more than just a feeling. That's what guilt is. The essence of the feeling of guilt is that my wrong is more than a feeling. Guilt is the sense of moral accountability. Let me throw in some synonymous phrases. Guilt is a sense that my wrongs have created an objective record. Like outside of me, there's this objective record of my wrongdoings. Guilt is the sense that I should be paying for that record. I have to do something to deal with that record. Guilt is the sense that my sins have got a being of their own. Guilt is the sense that I need to suffer for what I've done. Guilt is the sense that there is a moral accounting a moral objective record. There is a damned spot, as Lady Macbeth would say, that my wrongs have created. The feeling of guilt is the feeling that my guilt, my wrong, is more than a feeling. Vladimir Putin. What do you think about him? Is his guilt real? Or is it just an uncomfortable feeling he has? Oh, his guilt is real. It's huge. It's objectively there as a thing. It's not just in his head as a feeling. It's not merely psychological. If Putin were to confide in a friend, oh, I've got a guilty feeling about this war in the Ukraine. 
How should that friend advise him? Tell him to just find a way to handle those feelings? Have a glass of wine and a hot bath and they'll go away? Vladimir, comrade, speak positively to yourself. Tell yourself that the things you're worried you've done wrong aren't wrong at all. You decide what's right and wrong for you. So if it makes sense to you to send missiles against Ukrainian civilians and that's what you do, then you need to feel fine about it and not import some idea that it's murder. Is that what you think someone should say to Putin? Let's be clear. Any friend who gives Vladimir Putin advice like that is saying, Vladimir, take the place of God. You be God and decide what's right and wrong for yourself. Any feelings of guilt that hang around after that are just that, feelings, merely psychological. And I'll tell you, not one person here thinks that that's how Putin should be spoken to. Because, of course, Putin's guilt is not merely a feeling. It's real. But here's where I'm going with this. If his guilt is real, so is yours. Yes, your guilt is not as huge as his, but it's still real. A small rock is still a rock, even if it's not a boulder. And what we do wrong, at its heart, in its, in its essence, is a lot like what Putin is doing. Here's what I mean. We take the place of God and decide for ourselves what right and wrong will be, and then we do it. Okay? Of course, we're not operating as the head of a nation on a world stage with armies and modern weapons at our command. Our scope for causing hurt and suffering is much, much less. You and I are not the president of anything. Nonetheless, we also put ourselves in the place of God, keeping our rules and breaking his. Trespassing morally where we want to go, but where he says not to. The difference between Putin and ourselves is a matter of degree, not essence. And yes, there is a much worse punishment in hell stored up for a mass murderer like Vladimir Putin than for most other people. But it's not as though Putin's great sins will be punished while the lesser sins of others will be ignored. No. Again, it's a matter of degree. Even with human courts and human justice, the, the harshness of a jail term in a medium security prison or in a maximum security prison, etc., it varies according to what you've done. And so does the harshness of hell. There are degrees of punishment there. Actually, that's a very uh, well-attested teaching of the Bible. I don't know why people don't know it more. The Bible's clear on it. But there is a hell... And regular sinners do end up there, not just mass murderers. In Matthew 5, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, Jesus went on, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment and to the hell of fire. Guilt is not merely a feeling. And neither is the judgment of hell merely an idea. There are moral laws, and they're not just in your head. And there's a moral accounting, and it's not just in your head either. That's what guilt is. It's a sense of this. And just like in financial accounting, you know, actual money, if there's a debt, it's going to have to be dealt with. The, the, the children's message was not bad. It was actually a broken vase. It's going to be paid for. Okay? So in moral accounting... There is a reality of sin that will have to be dealt with. God cannot just say, let there be forgiveness and there's forgiveness. It has to be paid for. Think of that. It has to be paid for. What are we going to do about the guilt? What's God going to do about the guilt? Well, that brings us to the next section of this sermon. Dealing with guilt. How does God deal with it? The answer is right in our readings, it's all, and I think it's all through the Bible. It, 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 what I'm about to tell you about is in, is in every part of the Bible. God deals with it through the principle of self-substitution. This is the heart of the gospel message. This is the heart and essence of the Christian message. 
Self-substitution. We see it in Romans 5, verse 6, which we heard read a moment ago, where it says, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, like in the place of the ungodly. John Stott, who wrote this terrific book, The Cross of Christ, uh, he put it perfectly in two phrases. Stott writes, the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. And there it is. You see the appropriateness and the necessity of the cross right there. Stott said, the essence of sin is us substituting ourselves for God. You go, that's what sin is? Don't we normally say that sin is breaking the rules? Yeah, yeah, of course we do. But, but before that, like underneath that, behind all that, we, we need to know who created us. You are either an accident, not created by God with no purpose, or you were created by God. And of course you were. And if made by the creator God, then you belong to him. I mean, he made you. You're his. So when you make decisions as to how you're going to live your life, how you're going to use your body, which he gave you, how you're going to use your talent that he gave you, how you're going to spend your money, and you don't really bring God into any of that, except, of course, when you're in trouble and you pray for some kind of help, but otherwise, you're not giving God much attention. I'm saying unless you're willing to acknowledge his lordship over you, his ownership of you, his authority over you, then just by living your life like it's all your own, with very little reference to God, you're substituting yourself for him. Like you're your own owner and you are your own authority. And that's the essence of what sin is. Taking upon yourself prerogatives that only God has. Question, if, if, you're, if you're not a police officer, but you impersonate an officer, do you think you'd be put in jail for that? Of course. It would upend the entire authority structure of Suffolk County if people here went around clothed in police uniforms. How much more disruptive to the order of the cosmos is it for you to dress up as God, which is what you do when you sin? John Stott says, for the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God. Well, the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. In the next sentence, he goes on, man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. Which is where? He's talking about the cross. He means that God died on the cross. He went to hell. The thief on the cross didn't go to hell. Jesus did. The law, law of moral accounting had to be dealt with as a real thing. And in Christ, God came and really took what we deserved. The self-substitution. I heard a story some years ago about a man who operated a railroad lift bridge. You know, a bridge that could, could go up like this. Uh, the bridge was over a gorge where there was a big river. And he lived beside this bridge with his family. He had to open the bridge for ships to go through. One day, to his horror, the bridge was open and he could hear a train coming. A train was coming. Now, this was not a high-tech age and there was no way to contact the train nor would the train be able to see that the lift bridge was open till it was too late. So he rushed into the control room and he began to close the bridge. He looked way down below to the place where the big gears, you know, for the lift mechanism were. And he saw his little son playing there in the gears. He, he called him, but his son couldn't hear him. The train was coming. And suddenly he realized either his son was going to die or all those hundreds of people were going to die. You're on the edge of your seat. Why? Because there's nothing more intense than this. It's the ultimate trauma for one to die so that many will live. 
But I'm not going to finish this story. Things like this have actually happened. But this particular story is fictional. I'm using it to point you to the meaning of something that did really happen. Christ's death on the cross. One actually dying in the place of many. A substitutionary death for them. It's the most dramatic and precious thing that has ever happened. Indeed, it's even more precious than you realize. Because it tells us that Jesus Christ is the only one who ever chose to die. Now, I'm pretty sure what you're thinking. You're thinking, wait a minute. What about people who've committed suicide? Didn't they choose to die? What about people who have given their lives in heroic action? Okay, yeah. They chose the moment of their death, but only Jesus actually chose the fact of it. The people who committed suicide chose the moment of their death. They didn't choose the fact of the death. They were going to die sometime. But Jesus was never, ever going to die. He was the only person in history who absolutely, freely, without any constraint at all, walked in and poured out his life on the cross for no other reason other than the love of him for us. That's the self-substitution of God. Because we put ourselves where he deserved to be, he put himself completely, freely, voluntarily where we deserve to be. That is how he deals with guilt. Guilt has an objectivity. So God has an objective thing to do about it. Guilt is not just a feeling we can deal with with our feelings. Guilt is an objective record which we have to deal with with an objective act. And that act is what Christ did. What Christ did. Substituting himself for you on the cross. Well, let's get back to our feelings. We've moved away from our feelings in this message, and now this last section, let's come back to them. What do we have to do to get into us, to get into our hearts what God has done so that we're healed from guilt and live guilt-free lives? Here's how what God has done to deal with your guilt gets into your heart. You ready for this? Here's how he gets it into your heart. Absolution. Absolution. That's a noun coming from the verb absolve, which means to declare someone free from guilt. Christ has paid for the sins of the world. It's done. It's finished. And for that to now bring healing to your heart specifically today, you need to hear him declare to you that his sacrifice was for you. Absolution is a declaration of release from guilt. To be healed, you need to hear God say it to you. The thief on the cross beside Jesus. First, he makes confession. He confesses his sin. I am receiving what my sins deserve, he says. Then he turns to Jesus and speaks to him, prays to him, if you will. And the thief can see Christ on the cross right there, paying for his sins right before his eyes. And he hears Jesus' words of absolution addressed to him. Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. In other words, Jesus says to him, you're not going to hell. I've gone there for you to cancel your reservation. Your sins are forgiven. Where you're going today is to be with me in paradise. Despite the pain racking that thief's body on that cross, hearing that absolution, peace from God flooded into that man's soul. To have peace, you also need to hear God's declaration of your forgiveness, that what was accomplished on the cross, God's self-substitution was for you. So where can you hear that absolution? I'm going to give you two places. First, in the Lord's Supper, Words that Christ spoke on the night when he was betrayed, he speaks again to you every time we come to this meal. Okay? He gave the bread to his disciples and he said, take, eat. 
This is my body given what? For you. He's speaking to you. He's speaking to all his disciples of every time and every place. This is my body given for you, i.e., which I lay down in payment for your sins. In the sacrament, the Lord speaks to you, and he gives his body in the bread to you. And he says of the wine, drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. The wine, the blood, the words. He's giving it to you now, here. Your absolution. You can add nothing to how complete and how true these words of forgiveness are. Just believe them. (laughs) Resolve to agree with God. When he says you've sinned, don't, don't struggle against it. Just agree. And when he says you're absolved, don't argue. Just agree. I'm forgiven. My guilt is gone. Okay? By believing, you have what the words declare, removal of guilt and peace, reconciliation with God. The second place to hear God speaking absolution to you is in the part of the service called Confession and absolution, coming up in a moment in our service. In chapter 20 of the Gospel of John, where Jesus, now by that point in the Gospel, he's, he's risen from the dead, and he first meets there his amazed disciples, and he says, to, he says a lot of things to them, but among them he says this, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it's withheld. He says that to his church. What Jesus is doing is authorizing and empowering his church to declare absolution to all who confess. And the church calls a pastor to make sure that this super important function is not ignored, but it's exercised. So that when you hear the pastor of the church declaring to you that your guilt is forgiven for Christ's sake, that is as sure and as certain as if you were the thief on the cross listening to Jesus. You can add nothing to improve your absolution or make it more certain or effective or forgiving. Just receive the words and believe them. By believing, you have what the words declare. Removal of guilt, reconciliation, peace with God, healing in your soul. Amen.